Hey guys, so I have filmed this video probably like, I don't know, six times and I just don't like the way I'm doing it, so I'm redoing it again. So today we are talking about two different things. The first is POTS diagnostic criteria and I will show you how to do it. Um, and then we're also talking about the different types of POTS. Now, not everybody is gonna know what type of POTS they have and it doesn't always matter, um, but sometimes it can really affect how you are treated and also can just tell you a lot more about your POTS, so yes. So let's begin with the diagnostic criteria. So if a normal person, by normal I mean somebody without POTS, lies down um, and they then stand up, uh, they should experience a very small drop in blood pressure and to compensate a very small increase in heart rate. And then it goes back to normal almost immediately. They shouldn't feel dizzy, they shouldn't have any symptoms. I mean, every once in a while, it's normal to stand up too fast and to feel dizzy and symptomatic. It happens, I think, to everybody, um, but that should not be happening every single time that you stand up. And for somebody with POTS, it usually does happen every single time you stand up. So when we're talking about somebody with POTS, when they lie down and they have that base heart rate and they stand up, they have a dramatic increase in heart rate. So the diagnostic criteria, um, you're gonna have the testing done usually in one of two ways, either through a tilt table test or through mimicking a tilt table test. So let's just begin talking about the mimicking of the tilt table test because that's honestly probably the more common way people are diagnosed. There's not always a tilt table available. So when you're tested, you're going to lie down for probably five to 10 minutes. You're not supposed to talk or really move and then they're going to take your blood pressure and your heart rate and maybe other things as well. For me, it was just blood pressure and heart rate and when you're doing this yourself at home, um, if you wanna be doing this at home, you would use just like your heart rate and blood pressure monitor um, and you lie down, take it, write it down or just remember it. So then you're gonna stand up for 10 minutes or until like, if you're gonna faint, you know, if you're gonna faint, you should probably sit down. Um, but you're going to stand for 10 minutes and if you, either immediately or at any point within those 10 minutes, your heart rate increases 30 beats per minute or more, um, or 40 beats per minute or more if you are between the ages of 12 and 19, then that's indicative of POTS. Now, typically somebody with POTS is going to really feel symptomatic when they do this. Um, so it is important for you to you know, listen to your body. If you really need to stop, definitely stop. I mean, to be honest, if you feel like you need to stop, you probably would have already seen that increase in heart rate. So, um, you know, then you already have your answer. And of course, like you should never self-diagnose POTS. Like that's not at all what this is for. It's more to just let you know what might happen at the doctor's office or something that you can do before you see your doctor if you believe that you have POTS. And then you can, you know, write down the results and just tell them that, you know, this is what I did at home. And like, you know, this kind of just made me suspicious of POTS. So I thought I would bring it in because it might be helpful. Something like that. Um, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, now let's talk about the blood pressure side from this though, because the diagnostic criteria actually says that you cannot experience a decrease in blood pressure. And this is really confusing because a lot of people with POTS do experience drops in blood pressure, sometimes really large drops. And that's usually because they have something called orthostatic hypotension as well as POTS. So in my understanding, I think that this test and diagnostic criteria says that you cannot experience a significant drop in blood pressure is because they don't want somebody who has orthostatic hypotension and only orthostatic hypotension to accidentally get, get diagnosed with POTS. And that's because when somebody with orthostatic hypotension stands up and their blood pressure drops, um, sometimes their heart rate will, it will increase in order to compensate for that drop in blood pressure. And that increase in heart rate is only due to the fact that they have a drop in blood pressure and nothing else. It's not due to POTS. So if that person was medicated on something like midodrine, which increases your blood pressure, they would not experience that drop in blood pressure and therefore they would not experience that increase in heart rate. Whereas somebody with POTS, even if they also have orthostatic hypotension, on something like midodrine that would hopefully keep their blood pressure up, 
their heart rate would still increase because it's not increasing just because of the fact that your blood pressure dropped. It's increasing because you have POTS, but then you also happen to have orthostatic hypotension. So, I mean, but that's also, it's important for me to say, I'm not saying that midodrine helps everybody with orthostatic hypotension, like at all, or that it can help people with POTS because it can. Um, that was just like my way of making you guys understand. Um, so yeah, why don't we do the test together and then we'll get into the different types of POTS. So I'm lying down and my heart rate's at about 68 and my oxygen is 95. Stand up, you could see it starts rapidly increasing. Oxygen is still around 95. Um, goes up to 96. My heart rate, the max I reach is 117. If I continued standing, it would probably just keep fluctuating between maybe like 110 and 117. Sometimes it goes a little bit higher later on. And also keep in mind, I am medicated. Um, and then I lie down and you can see that it immediately starts to go back down and it actually reaches a lower number than it originally did down to 58. So in total, that was an increase of 49 beats per minute. So then I did this test again separately and I started off lying down with 114 over 76. And then when I stood up, it dropped to 99 over 76. So no change in the diastolic, but I decreased 15 points in systolic. And somebody who does not have any issues at all um, with blood pressure and heart rate would instead experience a very small drop in systolic and then an increase in diastolic. Uh, but for me, you know, that didn't happen. And then I lied back down and my blood pressure came back up again. Um, so I went to 116 over 78, which is 17 points um, increase in systolic and then two point increase in diastolic. So this was me showing you how to do this test. Again, you can do this at home or your doctor might do this for you in their office. And about the tilt table test, this would be another way that this test can be done. And it's just, it's, they can monitor a lot more and they can just, you know, really change your position a lot easier because what it is, is you're lying down on this table and you're strapped in and they can like tilt you up and down and up and down however they want to. So that's basically what a tilt table test is. It's the same thing. It's just that, you know, they can monitor it a little bit better and really control how you're standing. And if you do faint, you're not at a risk of hurting yourself. Whereas if you faint and you're standing, you could fall and hit your head. Now let's get into the different types of POTS. Now POTS is classified kind of in two different ways. There's primary and secondary, or there's different types. So first primary and secondary, what that means is if you have primary POTS, it means you just have POTS. Oftentimes the cause would be unknown and that really just is your condition. You just have POTS and POTS only, or if you have something else health related, it's not related to POTS. And then there is secondary POTS, which is POTS that's caused by another condition. And this is like also really common. Um, and there's a bunch of different types of conditions that can cause it. For me, it's Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, but a lot of people have it from a bunch of different from so many different conditions. And then there's that other way to classify it, which is the actual different types of POTS. So there are basically like three main types. There are other types as well, but not not really. It's hard sometimes to know if somebody is cause, if, if somebody's just saying the different causes or the different types, because you know, types and causes can kind of like overlap and it's it gets complicated. But let's just say that there are three types, okay? Um, so the three types are neuropathic POTS, also called partial dysautonomic POTS, um, hypovolemic POTS slash like issues with blood regulation, and then hyperadrenergic POTS. So neuropathic POTS is one of the more common types and it's basically damage to your nerves that control involuntary things like your heart rate and blood vessel constriction. and it causes increases in your heart rate and it makes it hard for your blood vessels to constrict and move that blood and it can lead to a lot of blood pooling. This type is really commonly associated with autoimmune diseases because they can actually attack your nerves and so that oftentimes is the cause but um, things like diabetes as well can really impact this. Um, and one of the really good things about neuropathic POTS is in many cases, it tends to get better after teenage years. I think that it said that around 16 tends to be like the worst years for neuropathic POTS. And then after that, a lot of times it can actually get better. So that is wonderful. And then there's hypovolemic POTS slash blood 
volume regulation issues. Let's first talk about that first part of the slash, which is hypovolemia. So that's where you're, you have really low blood volume. And when you stand up, naturally gravity will cause some of your blood to fall down to your legs. Um, but ideally, you know, you have enough blood that's still circulating above and ideally as well that your, your blood vessels would constrict and prevent too much blood from falling down to your feet. Um, but if you don't have a lot of blood or you have hypovolemia, um, you know, when some of that blood falls down, there's even less to circulate. And this can cause POTS because your body then causes your heart rate to increase and try to, you know, start pumping out as much blood as possible because it's recognizing that there's not enough blood circulating. But then there's also a second part to this, and this is where a lot of people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome actually come in. So it's not necessarily that we really have hypovolemia, though we may. Um, it's more that when we stand up, if you have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, your blood vessels are too stretchy, just like our skin is too stretchy and our joints are too hypermobile. Um, and so they have trouble constricting and preventing blood from falling down to your feet. And because of that, a lot more blood falls into your feet than normal. And due to that, um, your heart rate needs to increase because you're not getting enough blood. So it's almost as if we do have hypovolemia because so much extra blood goes down into our extremities versus anybody else with POTS. That's kind of why it's so, we sort of fall under the category of hypovolemic POTS, but not really because it's blood volume regulation. It's not really that we don't have enough blood volume unless, of course, you actually do have hypovolemia. I don't actually have hypovolemia. And what's interesting is that this type tends to respond really well to infusions of saline. And that's because saline increases your blood pressure, first of all, but it also puts fluids directly into your bloodstream, which can increase your blood volume. And it also has a lot of salt. So hopefully your body will retain the water because of that salt content. So this type can really respond well to things like that. And then there's hyperadrenergic POTS. And this is where after you stand up, you have an overactive sympathetic nervous system and this leads to high levels of norepinephrine being released. And this type causes a lot more sweating and anxiety and tremors than the other two types of POTS. Um, and that's due to the norepinephrine release. And it also causes a lot of the time, not always, but it oftentimes causes an increase in blood pressure, specifically an increase in diastolic blood pressure, which is that lower number. So if you have like, you know, like 90 over 60, 60 is that diastolic. So that would be higher, so higher than 60. I don't know why I use that number. This type is rare. It's more rare than the other two. And it is believed to potentially have a genetic component to it, because um, a lot of the times people in the same family can have this exact type of POTS. And unfortunately, with this type, it oftentimes progresses. Um, not always, but a lot of the times it does get worse and you need continued treatment, whereas somebody with neuropathic POTS, um, hopefully, you know, like it often happens, they get better as they age. And then hypovolemic POTS, I think it kind of stays the same, might get better, might get worse, you know, you never know. Now with these three different types, it is kind of important to know what type you have if it's possible to figure out. And that's because it really can affect the way that you are treated. You know, if you have something like hyperadrenergic POTS, you probably are not going to take midodrine to increase your blood pressure, assuming that you already have increases in blood pressure every time you stand up. Um, whereas hypovolemic POTS, or especially if you have EDS and that type of POTS, it'll be really helpful to take midodrine a lot, you know, things like that. Like I said, hypovolemic POTS responds well a lot of times to saline infusions. It's a treatment that's more specifically made and works better for one type of POTS versus another. So that's why it can be helpful to know what type you have. I hope that this video could be helpful for you. I think I say that in literally all my videos and that's just how I close it, but I really do mean that. I hope that this was helpful. Um, please let me know if you have any questions and I will see you on another video. Bye.